Hey guys, Miss Carlson here. I think you guys know the routine, but remember to have a notebook, sheet of paper, or a Cornell note taking template to get you going. We're going to cover part one of chapter six, uh, and it's basically a quick introduction of the skeletal system and its basic components. So let's go ahead and get going with a reminder of probably the most obvious thing you've learned about since you're very little is that our skeleton or our bones hold up the weight of our body. Now, bones work similarly to concrete, but they can be remodeled and reshaped. And they also work with our muscles to create movement. So that's one of the primary functions of the skeletal system. There are four others. Uh, the skeletal system also stores mineral reserves in the form of calcium salts, primarily, and then lipids or fats that are in the yellow marrow. It's responsible for blood cell production in the red marrow protection of soft tissues and organs, and it also acts as a lever to provide a wide range of movements. So the support that it provides with, you can see the picture here uh, with a skeleton, we stand together upright and without one, we look like a big pile of mush. So obviously that's very helpful. Then the blood cell production, you can see that our blood is made up of three components, our red blood cells, a wide range of white blood cells, and then of course your smaller platelets which perform clotting functions. As far as acting like a lever, if you uh, remember simple levers we talked about in physical science so maybe a long, long time ago for you, you have an effort force and a resistance force, and then you have that fulcrum which is basically the pivoting point. And so our body allows us to move in this fashion, kind of like in my basketball game tonight, my arm worked as a lever, although not a very good one. Um, but that's essentially what uh, our body does as far as movement for us. Now, we classify bones in order and according to their shape and their structure. Bone is also known as osseous tissue. It's a type of supporting connective tissue. Uh, Two-thirds of its weight is calcium phosphate, while only one-third is collagen fiber. And then about a 2% of that bone mass is made up of its cells or its osteocytes. We can look at the skeletal system macroscopically or microscopically. So macroscopically, we can see 206 of the major bones and its four general shapes. Uh, long bones are longer than they are wide. Uh, short bones are generally uh, equally proportional dimensionally. Uh, flat bones are very thin and broad, and then your irregular shapes or are obviously complex irregular shapes. There's no real commonality besides the fact that they're irregular and they don't fall into those other categories. Microscopically, bone tissue is made up of the following main components. You have your osteocytes or your bone cells. Lacunae, which store those osteocytes, are small little pockets that are basically between your lamellae, or narrow sheets of cal calcified matrix. <clears throat> and then canaliculi are small channels that interconnect the, la interconnect the lacunae uh, to nearby vessels for oxygen uh, requirements that are needed by the tissue. So taking a closer look at a typical long bone, you have the diaphysis or the central shaft, middle portion of the bone. Inside you have your internal marrow cavity and the expanded ends are called epiphyses or epiphysis for one of them. And they're covered with an articular cartilage, obviously helping with uh, pivoting on the point of articulation, which is at a joint. And we'll talk more about joints a little bit later. There are also two types of bone tissue, compact or dense, and then we have spongy and ca uh, cancellous. So compact and dense is very solid, it's found in stressful areas. The osteon is a functional unit, and then there are cylindrical lamellae that make up that osteon, and we'll take a closer look at that in a second. Now the spongy bone doesn't have osteons, the lamellae form trabeculae, or an open network of bony rods, and they're not exposed to heavy stress, obviously because they're not as solid. So we're going to take a closer look at the structure of a long bone. Here you have the diaphysis that I pointed out, which is a central shaft. And on the end, you have both epiphysis, or epiphyses, I'm sorry, epiphysis is a single one. The proximal epiphysis would be closer to the shoulder here for this uh, humerus bone. And then you have the distal epiphysis down here closer uh, to the radius and ulna. Now, uh, your marrow cavity is internal. And what else? Your spongy bone is normally at the ends or in the epiphyses. Uh, something we didn't mention yet is a periosteum. That's the outer surface covering. 
of the bone. Uh, it in intermingles with fibers of tendons and ligaments, and it functions to isolate the bone from other tissues. Uh, it's a route for circulatory and nervous supplies, and also participates in bone growth and repair. So that's on the outside. Your endosteum is inside the bone. It covers spongy bone and other inner surfaces. It's very active during bone growth and during repair and remodeling. Okay, here's a little bit of a closer look at your microscopic features. Here's an osteon, which you guys have seen before when we talked about connective tissues. You have your lamellae, okay, these concentric circles that have the lacunae in between or those small pits that store those osteocytes or those bone cells. And so speaking of bone cells, there are three main types that we want to know about. You have your osteocyte, which maintains bone tissue. It's the most abundant type of cell. It's, very, it's a very mature cell of the bone, and it recycles calcium salts to maintain that bone tissue. You also have the osteoblast, which helps form bone matrix in a process called ossification. They transform to an osteocyte once they're completely surrounded by a calcified matrix. Uh, finally, the other main uh, bone cell is the osteoclast, which is a giant cell with a, an abundance of nuclei. Uh, they secrete acids and enzymes to perform osteolysis or resorption, a breaking down of bone, and this helps to regulate the amount of calcium and phosphate in the body. 6.3 covers ossification and appositional growth. Uh, again, basically ossification is a conversion of tissue to bone. Your skeletal growth actually determines your size and proportions and starts at about week six after fertilization and stops at about age 25. So there is something called intramembraneous ossification that differentiates with embryonic or fetal fibrous connective tissue. So you have a picture here of the skull uh, forming bone, which is of course why you have to be very careful with an infant's head because the bone hasn't formed yet. <clears throat> so that occurs in deep layers of the epidermis very active process that requires oxygen, and this is a point where blood vessels start to grow to meet those demands and eventually become trapped inside the bone for future use. There's also something called enchondrial ossification. That's where the bone is going to form from existing hyaline cartilage, and most bones form this way. <clears throat> Once this happens, appositional growth can occur once that osseous tissue forms, and this just is the elongation or enlargement of the bone. So new osseous tissue is deposited while the osteoclasts erode the inner surface to enlarge uh, that inner marrow cavity to grow the bone as you grow yourself. Of course, in order to grow bone, we have to have a um, mineral resource that is required. Uh, calcium salts is a big one, makes up the primary uh, source of your bones. You also need vitamin D3 for normal calcium absorption and vitamins A and C for growth and maintenance. Uh, low vitamin C would actually result in something called scurvy or weak, brittle bones from low osteoblast activity, which doesn't really happen that often anymore. Uh, finally, and lastly, 6.4 talks about growth and development and how we depend on a balance of those osteoclasts and osteoblasts. So the components of the bone are continually recycled and renewed through a process called remodeling that is done by these cells. Uh, regular mineral turnover will occur, which allows your bone to adapt to stresses as you age. Uh, this is just a quick look at how that works. Basically, you have your osteoclasts that will uh, break down resting bone in order to recycle and renew uh, that bone with new minerals with the help of the osteoblasts. And then, of course, your bones aren't unbreakable. Uh, extreme loads, sudden impacts, or unusual stresses can occur. And so a fracture is generally named after its external appearance, location, and nature of the break. So closed is an internal break, open, projects through the skin. And the events to repair a bone fracture include the formation of a fracture hematoma or a blood clot. And then, of course, you have cartilage that starts to form there that eventually is going to re be replaced by bone tissue with the help of those bone cells and then remodeling over time will give you your new bone and it will eventually uh, repair itself. And that is it for part one. Uh, part two will come at a later time. Uh, pause and play as you like and I will see you next time. <clears throat>